Hey everybody, this is Dan and this is another in our series of mini desktop lectures. And uh, this, this uh, presentation today I'm going to call Essential Technologies and it's about three decades of rapid innovation and transformation in the country. Um, just to sort of recap where we've come from, first we talked about this capitalist ethos, this idea of uh, capitalism in the United States and we went back all the way to the Puritans and the Massachusetts Bay Company and looked at some of these capitalist roots. And then we talked about, uh, in, the, in the previous video, we talked about the stabilization of the economy under Alexander Hamilton. And we talked about the debates between Hamilton and Jefferson. And as we move forward, we know that the country uh, begins to expand, at least, you know, from a geographical standpoint with the Louisiana Purchase and also this notion of expanding commerce, expanding business. And, you know, historians typically call the period between the, or before the Civil War, between, let's say, Hamilton's time and the Civil War as the time of market revolution. And we're going to look at some of the components that were in place uh, for the market revolution to occur. Now, I call this presentation Essential Technology, and, you know, we probably need to define what Essential Technology is. I know to many of us, including myself, right now Essential Technology is the iPhone. But Essential Technology, as far as uh, the build-out of the country concern is concerned, is a little bit different. And uh, here's, you know, Professor Dan's Law of Essential Technology that states there can be no industrial revolution without an agricultural revolution and there can be no agricultural revolution without a transportation revolution so so keep this in mind as we look at how commerce and business developed in the united states now the transportation piece of this is is pretty amazing to think about because in hamilton and jefferson's time in the late 1700s Transportation technology had essentially gone unchanged since ancient Rome. The way people got around, the way goods and services, or the way goods were shipped was via horse, cart, and on foot. So it was a very inefficient way to, to move people and move goods and really stymied the growth of a, of a modern economy. I read a history the other day that talked about a shipment of uh, textile manufacturing spindles or supplies back in the late 1700s and how the trip from Massachusetts up by Boston uh, down, to, down to Charleston would take 70 plus days. So you can see there were uh, very few, there were no developed roadways, travel by horse took a long time and was very perilous. Now the first point to remember on this, on this idea of essential technologies or the first essential technology as far as transportation is concerned uh, is in 1807 and, and Robert Fulton and the invention of the steamboat. And the invention of the steamboat was groundbreaking because it really opened up river transportation from the Ohio River down to the Mississippi River. You know, Fulton, like many inventors who come up with a new technology, was really derided. People called his steamboat Fulton's Folly. Nobody thought it was going to work. And uh, in 1807, the little Claremont here that you see on the screen made it from uh, New York City all the way up to Albany, which is about 150 miles. Now, it was only going five miles an hour, but think about this. You know, prior to this time, there was no mechanical transportation or at least, you know, powered transportation whatsoever. So uh, Fulton's invention is a, a major uh, point of importance when we're looking at the transportation revolution. And, you know, 20 years after that first steamboat, the Claremont, it's estimated there were over 200 steamboats on the Mississippi River, which really connected the Ohio River and the Midwest all the way down to New Orleans and opened up shipping like never before. In 1811, just a few years after Fulton's development, the National Road began to be constructed. And the National Road is one of the first turnpikes, if you will, and it was financed largely by government money. So this idea that Alexander Hamilton had in the late 1700s that there should be federal funding available for infrastructure projects in, in, in an effort to build up commerce in the country comes to fruition in 1811. And if you've ever driven Interstate 71, 
or Interstate 70, I'm sorry, down by Columbus, um, you've driven over parts of the old National Road. And after that time in the early 1800s, there, we see a whole network of turnpikes and overland routes being established to help move goods over land. In 1817, of course, the governor of New York, whose name is DeWitt Clinton, uh, proposes the construction of the Erie Canal. And just like Fulton, um, Clinton was derided. People thought that this plan was foolish. It could never happen. People called it Clinton's big ditch. But uh, the Erie Canal was completed um, in the 18, late 1820s, and it opened up the shipping route from New York City to the Great Lakes. This is incredibly important when we look at the development of the country and as another major point in what I'm calling the transportation revolution because by opening up the Great Lakes to the East Coast with a water route, cities even as far away as Chicago start to grow uh, exponentially. And, you know, uh, uh, it, it, it took 20 days to get from Buffalo to New York City uh, prior to the Erie Canal. After the Erie Canal was put into place, it took five to six days. So not only did it speed up transportation and open marks, markets that way, but also the cost of shipping freight went way down. There were estimates that it was like $125 a ton to ship goods from Buffalo to New York prior to the Erie Canal, and it went down to $5 per ton thereafter. So a pretty significant development in the growth of business and commerce uh, and infrastructure in the country. In 1828, we see the first major railroad established in the country, and that was the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad uh, established in Baltimore. And it started with uh, 70, I think 80 miles of track in 1828, but by 1840, there were already 3,000 miles of track in the country. And again, that might not seem like a lot uh, in today's standards, but at the time, that was twice as much track that existed uh, uh, anywhere else in the world, in including Europe and the UK. So it's the beginning of the railroad, and for the next couple of lectures, uh, even all the way up through the Gilded Age in the late 1800s, the railroad's going to take center stage in business in the, uh, in the United States. And here's a picture of the first crude locomotive or the type that the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad would use. So, you know, the transportation revolution really begins with Fulton in 1807, and we take it all the way out to 1828 and the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. The agricultural revolution, there's, there's two major points I want, I want to talk about. Um, you know, as far as invention goes and mechanization of farming goes, you know, we have to start with Cyrus McCormick in 1834. And McCormick invented or at least patented the mechanical reaper. And the mechanical reaper was a significant step along the way in the agricultural revolution because prior to the mechanical reaper harvesting wheat was done by hand farmers would use a sickle to cut the wheat and they could harvest about a half acre per day of wheat after the mechanical reaper they could harvest 12 acres per day of, of wheat so you can see how productivity increased which allowed more food to be produced and that's a, a, a very significant point when we look at how agriculture was evolving during that period of time. Now, you may find it odd that I put a picture of Steve Jobs up with Cyrus McCormick, but it's important to talk about McCormick not only as an inventor, if you will, but also a marketer. Much like Steve Jobs, McCormick, even though he did patent the Mechanical Reaper, he wasn't really uh, the person who was solely responsible for its invention. Many people had come before and many people worked for McCormick, to uh, develop and perfect the Mechanical Reaper, but McCormick was the one who patented the device, and also he was a modern marketer in the sense that he really believed in promoting the Reaper, and he did this mainly by having a sales force. And if you look at the history of business in the U.S., McCormick's one of the first ones to have a sales force that would go out and actually demonstrate the Reaper to farmers. So, you know, much like Steve Jobs, he was, he was a marketing genius, and I think when we look at these early inventors who were successful, we need to look at not only the invention itself, but their approach to going to market, because that's something that plays out again and again in the history of American business. So, you know, we quickly turn to 1837 and John Deere. There really was a John Deere, and he's famous for the invention of the steel plow. 
Now consider that before the steel plow, plows were made mainly of all wood or iron. So they would wear out quickly. They were ineffective as far as uh, tilling rough soils. And John Deere came along with the steel plow, which was lightweight, was very effective. And uh, if you're a farmer, the shape of the mold board, the little thing you see at the bottom there, um, you know that that's a, uh, an effective way of actually turning the soil and giving you better tillage, helping crops grow better. And the other thing about John Deere that's significant, much like Cyrus McCormick, he had a marketing angle to his device. He was one of the first ones to make plows and put them in stock. In other words, prior to John Deere, many, um, many goods or many machines were made to order. In other words, you would get an order for a machine, you would manufacture it for the customer and ship it. John Deere had the idea that he would make uh, many plows and stock the plows. And the nice thing about that was a farmer could see a plow and he could buy it or what I'll say, drive it away today. So a farmer actually got to see which plow he was getting and it allowed Deere to ship faster and uh, his product, the Moline plow it would later be known, was very popular and really changed the way that, that farming was done. So um, I just want you to keep in mind that these years between 1807 and 1837 are the years of what I call essential technologies. They began to change the way goods and services were transported across the country and also uh, this, we start to see this, this great increase in capacity of farming which is important as we move on to a period of industrialization in the United States. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, let me know and I'll see you again real soon. Thank